Um, welcome everyone to Ideas That Move the World Forward, which is a platform for us at Duke Forward to showcase some of Duke's top thinkers. And today we're really excited to have David Schiffman and Walter Wright um, here to talk about something everyone loves, um, sharks, or fears, loves and fears, sharks. Um, so David graduated from Duke University in 2007. He's now a PhD student at the University of Miami, where he's coming to us um, from today. Uh, and he's researching shark biology and conservation, as well as how information related to ocean science and conservation spreads through social media. So that's why David is prolific on social media. He has like about 100 million Twitter followers, and he's great on Facebook and all of that. Um, and David shark, uh, David's research interests include the feeding behavior, behavior and ecology of sharks, as well as shark fisheries management and conservation policy. And most importantly, he has yet to be bitten by a shark. Um, Walter, uh, Walter Wright is currently a grad student at Duke's Nicholas School of the Environment, in the, and he's in the Coastal Management Program. His interests include preservation and education of natural places, especially around, recre especially around recreational studies. He's currently in Maui, and um, yesterday he had um, palm trees and coconut trees in the background, but today I think he has a more sedate background. He's currently in Maui assisting uh, an educational organic farm and sustainable building initiative. So thank you so much, you two, for taking the time today to hang out with us. And um, sure. the, format's, the format's going to be, um, Walter's going to be asking David a series of questions. David's going to be sharing his shark experiences with us, and then we'll leave about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A with our audience. So take it away. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, David. Good morning. I, think something that, I think something that comes up for any field of study is how does someone become interested in whatever topic they are? So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this field and if it was something at a young age or something once you got into college? Sure. Well, I, I've been interested in sharks as long as my family can remember. At my master's thesis defense, my parents had sent pictures of toddler me in a shark t-shirt to my advisor to feature in the slideshow. Uh, I, I, I feel like most kids go through either a shark thing or a dinosaur thing. And I actually had both of those. That The shark one stuck. Uh, I, I already knew I wanted to be a marine biologist and already knew that I wanted to work eventually with shark feeding ecology and migration studies at the time that I applied to Duke, the presence of the marine lab and the easy access to undergraduate research is what really attracted me there. So there were certain things about Duke and about the marine lab program that very much interested you that helped you progress along your path? Absolutely. Uh, there are many schools where there are, are uh, somewhat limited research opportunities for undergraduates, uh, where you either have to do what the uh, what the the head of the lab already has a project in mind and just needs someone to do it, or sometimes the opportunities are just things like you need to clean the glassware for the the older research staff. At, at the Duke Marine Lab, I talked to uh, Dr. Dan Richoff there and said, I'm interested in maybe doing something with feeding ecology of stingrays or sharks here in the Outer Banks. I noticed you don't do anything like that right now. Could we go there to create something? And he said, sure, let's go out kayaking, and we'll get get you some rays. And we did. It, it was awesome. Uh, our, our lab here at the University of Miami is, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the undergraduate ed mentorship and engagement that we do here. Uh, we have currently 25 undergraduate and master's level interns that I help train, and they, they help us uh, go out in the field and do research. Some of them do run their own projects. They help us in the lab. They help us go into schools. Uh, but there are not many other places that have opportunities like that, and Duke, Duke was one of them, and it was a, a wonderful undergraduate research experience for me. Well, there's a reason I chose Duke also, so uh, good choice. <laughs> um, it's something very interesting about you know that experiential education that we can actually get out there and touch and feel whatever you're interested in studying, and it sounds like Duke and also Miami is providing that for you. I know you also like to take that now and help out in schools. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think it's important to uh, become involved in local schools? Sure. Uh, public literacy in, in science and conservation issues is an increasingly important issue. Uh, if people don't know it's a problem or don't know how to fix it, then it's not likely to get fixed. We live in a participatory democracy, which means we need majority support uh, to at least elect elected officials 
that support a science-based conservation agenda. So it's important that citizens know what's going on. Uh, our lab now uh, at the University of Miami, we took in 2015, we took over 1,300 members of the, of, the, of the community out on the boat with us, ranging in age from 10 to 80, including a group of Duke alumni uh, here in the South Florida Duke Alumni Club. Uh, everyone gets to learn about local conservation issues and how they can help. They get to participate in the field research and things like that. Uh, and we, we bring out over a thousand high school students, including many from historically underserved schools. Uh, also, we speak to local high schools. We go in person to them uh, and speak to science classes or to assemblies or things like that. And I, I've also trained many of our interns to do that uh, as well so we can do it on a, on a larger scale. We also Skype into classrooms all over the world. Wow. Is there um, any story that you tend to tell, say, like a younger audience that uh, is really exciting or surprising that, uh, in, that you, it's a theme that you like to talk about with some of these students? Well, I, I like to talk to them about the fact that science is not just uh, memorizing facts. Science is not just memorizing parts of the periodic table. It's an active process. It's a human process. And it can be very exciting and even fun uh, to participate in. And getting to see that firsthand when people actively participate uh, in our field research helps a lot. We have an ongoing study tracking uh, the, the students that participate with us and if they are more likely or less likely to participate in uh, science issues in the future, if they're more or less likely to go to college, things like that. So w we like to uh, expose people to real science. For many of these high school students, we're the first scientists they've ever met. Uh, we've had people tell us, uh, I didn't even want to go to college before I met you guys. Now I want to do what you do. And at least some of them have gone on to the University of Miami and now work with us. So it's very rewarding. I think that's very beneficial for you know children these days to understand that there are different aspects of what we can do in the world, and a scientist is not necessarily somebody in a white lab coat that's always inside a lab. So uh, I think it's great that you're helping students, younger students, understand the options. Um, I'm wondering also when you do talk to these students, a lot of people think you know sharks are all bad, and there's these myths that they're going to attack people. Would you mind talking about a couple of the uh, the myths that maybe aren't quite accurate? Sure. Uh, lots of people seem to think that if you, that sharks are so dangerous and so bloodthirsty and murderous ragey that if you dip your toe in a bathtub, then a shark's going to eat your whole family. Uh, and they, that's just not the case. They are uh, large wild animals that are predators. Uh, very rarely sharks do bite people. Very rarely those bites cause serious injury uh, or even death. And that's, I don't want to minimize that. But the, uh, the relative risk of something like that happening is extremely low. More people are bitten by, or more people are killed each year by cows than by sharks. More people are killed by vending machines. More people are bitten in uh, by other people on the New York City subway every year than are bitten by sharks in the whole world. More yeah, people. You don't have to worry about killer cows. Oh, cows are really dangerous to begin with. My mom grew up uh, with an uncle who owned a cattle ranch, and she almost died one summer with a cow chasing her. Uh, they're, they're, but sharks are, are uh, you need to respect them. There's some common sense safety precautions you can take, but they're really not something that you need to worry about. If you've been in the ocean, there has been a shark near you. It knew you were there, and it didn't bother you. Yes, sharks are, uh, it's a big ocean out there, isn't it? Is there any part of the ocean that sharks are more prevalent? Well, sharks are, in fact, uh, declining in population in many parts of the world, in some cases pretty rapidly, pretty severely. Uh, some, si scientists have documented some population declines of 90% or more since the 1970s, and these are animals that were swimming in the ocean 100 million years before there were dinosaurs on land. We've killed 90% of some of them in, uh, in, our, in my parents' lifetime. But there, the U.S. has relatively healthy shark populations due to, due to some strong science-based management by the National Marine Fisheries Service, but there are still some, some issues that are actively being worked on. There, the Bahamas has a lot of sharks. They banned shark fishing uh, gear about 20 years ago and more recently became what's called a shark sanctuary, banning all kinds of commercial fishing for sharks. 
Uh, but there are lots of places where shark populations are declining really rapidly. In fact, one in four known species of shark skates and rays are on the IUCN red list as threatened with extinction. Or one of the most threatened groups of vertebrates in the world. Uh, amphibians are worse, but few else are. So you've talked a little bit about, you know, common myths that are maybe not quite accurate. Are there other facts that are important for the audience to hear about? Well, not only are sharks not a threat to you or your family, but they, ha they have a very important ecosystem role that makes them much more valuable to humans. Uh, we're, we're better off without them th or with them than we are without them, though many people do have uh, what I think is largely an irrational fear. But sharks help regulate food webs. Uh, predators help keep the food chain in balance. Where I'm from outside of Pittsburgh, we used to have wolves, but we killed the wolves because wolves are scary. And now there's too many deer. And all the deer are sick, and all the deer are malnourished, and they cause lots of property damage and even injury to humans because they go places they wouldn't otherwise go because there's not enough food in their normal habitat. And the same type of thing can happen in the ocean. Uh, also, sharks influence uh, whole ecosystems through what's called fear ecology. They, their mere presence causes fish to decide, oh, maybe I'm not going to forage in that part of the habitat today. There's a shark there. I might get eaten. And when sharks are gone, you get what's called fear release, and that can cause uh, huge ecosystem disruption. So we are we are better off with sharks than we are without them. Wow, that sounds very interesting. Does it? I know there's different uh, like ranges of sharks. You have smaller sharks, medium sharks, larger sharks, and I thought I read something that you talked about one time that I think you specialize more in the mid range and. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on the differences between them? There are, as of a couple months ago when I, I checked with the IUCN Taxonomy Committee to make sure I was writing a pub trivia question correctly, there were 512 recognized species of sharks. Uh, they, have, they are hugely variable in shape, size, color, behavior, habitat. Uh, some are only a few inches long. Some are the size of a school bus. Some, uh, some are bubblegum pink in color. Some glow in the dark. Some live under Arctic ice. Some live in the deepest parts of the ocean. So they're an incredibly diverse group. The, the groups that I worked with for my master's degree was shark pups, young of year, that ranged in size from about that, that size for Atlantic sharp nose to maybe that size for some of the other ones. The, we're, we're now at the University of Miami, we're focusing on larger individuals. Uh, the, largest, uh, the largest individual that I personally caught with the lab is about a 14-foot tiger shark. Uh, the largest individual the lab has caught was two and a half feet bigger than that, also a tiger shark. But we we also get some black, a lot of black tip sharks and nurse sharks that are four, five, six, seven feet. How do you uh, catch a shark? We uh, it's it's fishing. Uh, our, a lot of a lot of scientific field research is essentially fishing. We use gear called a drumline with a hand reel uh, and. It's an independent unit of fishing gear. It's kind of it's a, a rod and reel. Is you you have one hook in the water, and you're, uh, and you're able to catch one thing at a time. And it's physically connected to you and the boat. A drum line is one hook in the water that's not connected to the boat. It's connected to a weight on the bottom and a float to the surface. We have ten of those, so we can catch ten sharks at a time. Uh, we don't catch that many because populations are in decline, but that's that's how it works. And it's a ba it's a baited hook attached to a weight attached to a float to the surface. So with populations in general in the marine world declining, what do you see as the next big uh, the next big thing in conservation and shark research? Well, there there are a lot of ongoing issues uh, in shark research. We need to more explicitly clarify exactly what the ecosystem role of sharks is. Uh, we know that in many cases they can benefit the food web. We know that in in uh, many cases their their loss can negatively affect the food web. But we need to know exactly uh, how that works and how widespread it is and how it varies between situations. We need to know exactly how many uh, exactly what the population trends are. Uh, many species of sharks don't have uh, reliable stock assessment numbers, particularly in the developing world that might not have good fisheries management infrastructure, but also in some also many other places. Uh, we need to know just basic questions such as where do sharks go and when? What are they doing there? What are they eating when they're there? Uh, things of that nature. 
So for people that might be more interested in sharks and their habitat and uh, their migration patterns, um, where would you recommend somebody becoming more involved and more educated about this field of study? Well, our lab's website, sharktagging.com, uh, we have a link to it where you can track our satellite tag sharks. We put GPS trackers on our sharks every time their fin breaks the surface it tells us where they are and we put that information out on Google Earth where anyone can read it and our sharks go all over the world. Uh, people can also adopt their own shark which covers the cost of a GPS tag for us. You get to come on the boat with us when we tag it, you get to name the shark and then you get to updates on wherever it goes throughout the world. Uh, but that's one way that you could do it. Also all of our lab's research is available for free for anyone to read on, on that website. Uh, I also share a lot of updates through my, my social media, either things that I've written or things that my colleagues have written. My Twitter is at Why Sharks Matter. My Facebook is facebook.com slash Why Sharks Matter. And all that inf I, I make all that information accessible to everyone, and I'm, and I'm an happy to answer questions as long as I have time. That's great. I know social media is important to you, and I think it's just about getting that word out. Um, what's that website again for shark tagging? Sharktagging.com. SharkTagging.com, and have there been some interesting names that people have uh, called their sharks when they get to name them? Um, there, there have been a few. We had a, a, a somewhat of a sad story recently, but uh, the Duke fans might appreciate the first part of it. That we had a University of Wisconsin alum uh, don't, or a University of Wisconsin alum's parent donate a shark for their daughter for Wisconsin graduation. It was named Bucky Badger, uh, and that shark had some really cool patterns. Uh, it was basically doing laps around the Gulf of Mexico, huge migration pattern, and uh, unfortunately it was recently killed by fishermen in Cuba. Um, how often does a shark um, come to the surface like that? It varies widely by species. Some species go to the surface several times a day, or uh, some species hang out pretty much right at the surface and break the surface several times a day, rather. Uh, others, it might be weeks in between. Some basically never do. There are many species that, that live on the bottom uh, and, and spend most of their time on the bottom. So there are different, uh, different types of tag technology designed around that. Some are physically attached to the fin, some trail behind a shark uh, with, on, a, on a line, some are designed to pop off after a certain amount of time and float to the surface. It, mm -hmm. de and, uh, it depends on, on the species in question. And is it true that not all species of shark have teeth? They all have some degree of teeth. Uh, so, uh, some, are, some are filter feeders, uh, whale sharks, basking sharks, uh, they eat plankton. So they don't really have teeth, maybe in the traditional sense, but it's they have uh, similar to something like a blue whale or a, one of the baleen whales. They they uh, in, ingest enormous amounts of water and filter out the plankton for them to eat. Nice. So what's next for you? Anything that we should be uh, keeping an eye out for in David's Shark World? Well, I am hoping to defend my PhD and in, uh, in the spring, early summer and um, uh, we'll be moving on to a new position somewhere and uh, yeah, I'll keep everyone posted on where, where I go. I'm in the applying phase at the moment. Nice. Is there uh, any takeaways that we should uh, listen to or look for from you today? Well, the, the sharks are, are just not something that you really need to be worried about. It's that so few people have any kind of negative interaction with sharks. Most people have a totally neutral interaction and don't even realize it. Uh, but sharks are incredibly healthy shark populations and healthy fish populations in general are so important to, uh, to having a, a, a strong coastal ecosystem that, that millions of Americans and people around the world depend on for food and employment. That sounds great. I think we might have some questions that have come in. Is that true? Yeah, we have some great ones. Um, Excellent. The first one I was going to start with is something I think a lot of people, it's kind of a myth that a lot of people have about sharks, and maybe you can help us bust it. Um, do sharks ever sleep, or do they need to constantly swim in order to stay alive? That's a great question. And it, again, it depends on the species. Uh, sharks don't ever really sleep in any traditional sense that we're used to. Uh, some can rest. Some have more, some are more or less active during the day or during the night. Some physically can sit on the bottom for long periods of time and are able to pump water over their gills. But most do need to, or at the very least many, need to be swimming pretty much constantly in order to force water over their gills so they can breathe. 
Um, and another question, it's an, about an issue that is on the top of a lot of conservationists' minds. Um, is there any progress in stemming the shark finning demand? So the shark fin soup and the shark fin trade is an important conservation issue, but it often gets misreported. So I may take, give a longer answer on this than the person expected. Uh, shark fins uh, ha are made of cartilage. Uh, the shark's entire bodies are made of cartilage, but the fin rays can be made into a, a noodle-like substance that's put in a, in a soup that's a part of traditional Chinese medicine. And with the recent economic boom in China, there has been a great deal of demand for this, and it's it's been a major driver of shark overfishing. But the shark, shark finning and the shark fin trade are a subset of shark overfishing. I see a lot of people saying we need to stop shark finning. Yet, but we also need to stop other things too. And if we stop other things, it will also stop shark finning. If we just stop shark finning, it won't stop the other issues. So I say stop shark overfishing. But yes, the short answer is there has been uh, there have been attitude changes documented in Hong Kong uh, due to a variety of factors, um, and there's been declining consumption of shark fin, but at the same time, greatly increasing trade in shark meat. So sharks are still being killed just for different reasons and focusing just on the fins as some uh, some well-intentioned advocates do really does a disservice. Thank you. Um, and here's one for people living in North Carolina. Um, thoughts? What thoughts do you have on what might have caused this spike in shark attacks off the uh, North Carolinian coast last summer? Or was there actually a spike? I think you and I have talked about that before. Yes. Well, the, it's it's a tricky issue because there were slightly more people bitten by sharks than than there typically are, and there are a variety of factors behind that. Mo a lot of it is just there's more people in the water, uh, so you have a higher chance of encounter. If a really rare event, if repeated several, uh, many more times, is more likely to happen. There are with the the U.S. recession ending, more people are able to take vacations. The Outer Banks are a great place to vacation, so there are more people in the water. Another part of it is at least several of the bites that occurred this summer occurred right next to where people were chumming the water for sharks and fishing. Uh, people perhaps should not be swimming right next to where there's a chum slick and people fishing for water or fishing for sharks. People also perhaps should not fish right next to where there are people swimming. There are ways that we that different resource users can share the beach. Uh, that was not done very well, and we're starting to see the negative consequences of that. Uh, there's a, a variety of other things proposed, uh, but I see all these videos that get shared on Facebook with someone takes a video of a shark swimming by the beach and the news re reports it as, oh my god, there was a shark right by the beach. There have been sharks right by the beach for millions of years. The only thing that's different is now everyone has a video camera with them at all times with their smartphones. Um, what are your thoughts on the mockumentaries that Discovery Channel has produced recently, like Megalodon? Megalodon. Megalodon. Uh, and, yeah. Megalodon. There you go. And then, is it generating a new generation of shark fans or hurting the cause? The when a educational television channel makes up lies for the purpose of scaring people, it is not good for anyone except the ratings of that channel. Uh, it is really bad for public science literacy. Real scientists got harassment and threats because of it. Uh, I got harassment and threats because of it. Every time I speak with high school students or middle school students, someone asks me about Megalodon. Uh, there is no doubt whatsoever that that shark did exist, but has not for millions of years. If there was a 60-foot-long shark swimming in shallow coastal waters, someone would have seen it. Uh, they, if if Discovery used uh, actors pretending to be scientists and witnesses and victims, Discovery used CGI video and photoshopped images, and they didn't say that it was fake. Uh, it's really trouble, really troubling, and I, I raised some concerns about this through social media. The Tampa Bay Times last year called me Shark Week's biggest critic, uh, but this year they listened. They listened to criticism raised by me and raised by others. And they this year was much better. They had a return to science-based programming. They had a return to reality-based programming. And I don't mean like reality TV. I mean based in reality rather than making up things. And they had, their, they had record ratings. So I'm optimistic that it's going to stay good. But educators and scientists are still going to be dealing with the impacts of that, as well as Animal Planet uh, airing a documentary that said that mermaids are real and the U.S. government is covering it up. We're going to be dealing with that for a long time because it aired on an educational television channel and it didn't say it was fake. Wait, mermaids aren't real? 
Um, was there anything else you'd like to add about that question? I could talk about that all day, but I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, leave it to other questions. Other than to say that I and another uh, Duke alum, Andrew Thaler, published a paper about uh, that called Fish Tales, Combating Pseudoscience on Television uh, that came out recently and is open access if anyone wants to read. It describes our strategy and, and how to deal with it and what other scientists can do about it. Um, David, could you recommend maybe a couple uh, documentaries that are more accurate, that are worthwhile to view? Do I still have it right next to me? No, I don't. I don't. The, BB, the recent BBC Shark documentary was unbelievable. It was fantastic. One of the best science or nature documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, we watched it with our lab, with all of our undergraduate and master's interns, and everyone's jaw was dropped. Uh, just incredible footage and not focusing on scary stuff. Uh, there, are, there are other good ones that arise from time to time. Shark Week has a series called uh, Alien Sharks which despite the somewhat bizarre name, is focuses on real animals that live in the deep sea or uh, just weird looking sharks. That's fantastic. Uh, they also have a several recurring series that are focusing on uh, the, the great white shark research off New England uh, that focuses on real scientists. That's good work. Mm -hmm. that there are, so there are, there's good stuff out there. But there's also some troubling stuff. Is it the BBC One documentary you're talking about? It's just called Shark. That's what just it is. And there's Shark. Yes, it came yeah, there's out, several it came parts. Out this year. Yeah, it was in June. Um, yeah, those are great recommendations. I'm going to go look them up. Um, so the next question: What are your thoughts on the white shark commercial cage diving industry in places like South Africa and New Zealand? So cage diving is a somewhat of a controversial subject, um, and I'll tell you both sides of it and what I think. There are people that think that it is a good thing because it makes sharks more valuable alive than dead, and also it lets people very safely interact with sharks and then tell their friends, I saw a shark and it didn't bite me, look how cool these pictures are, and maybe can change some, some hearts and minds. Uh, there are some people that think that the specific practices of some uh, shark ecotourism operators are not great for sharks because they maybe put too much bait in the water and maybe that might cause the sharks to change their normal habits. It might cause them to associate boats or human divers with food, which could be troubling. Uh, so there, it's a bit of a controversy and the answer really is it depends on the specific situation. Uh, some operators are very responsible. Some operators do a lot of macho cowboy nonsense. There's a disturbing trend recently of people riding sharks. You should not do that, guys. It's a, there's a 14, 15, 16 foot long wild predator. Respect it. Look, but don't touch. No one would try that with a grizzly bear or a lion. Uh, but there are. I've done. I did a great white cage dive in South Africa last summer, and it was awesome. And that was with a very responsible diver, and that's uh, Chris Fallow, who's frequently featured on Shark Week and any of the uh, the ones with the great white sharks jumping. Uh, that's his work, and he's also been in some other stuff. That was awesome. It was not disruptive to the sharks at all. They just had one fish head in the water that they would drag back and forth. They didn't dump gallons of chum or anything like that. Um, there, but there's also diving with all other kinds of sharks around the world. Uh, some of our lab's work has found that there are hundreds of these shark-focused shark ecotourism sites around the world, ranging from reef sharks to tiger sharks to uh, bull sharks. And it's there's some that are, are very good for sharks. There's some that are perhaps their individual practices are not ideal. Uh, and there are some efforts right now underway to sort of characterize that and make a, like a trip advisor type site, but for how ecolo ecologically responsible is this operator. Um, the next question, what are new methods you will use in your study on feeding ecology and behavior of sharks? So I use a technique that's called stable isotope analysis. Uh, the old way that people used to figure out what sharks were eating was to basically cut them open and see what was inside. And that's obviously direct and effective, but it can be problematic if you're dealing with threatened species. You don't want to kill hundreds of them for, for a study. So stable isotope analysis is based on the premise that on a molecular level, you really are what you eat. When you eat something, uh, molecules of that something and atoms of that something are incorporated into your body. That's what digestion and growth is. So you can trace the radioactive signature of that using stable isotope analysis and by comparing the radioactive signature of the blood of a shark with the radioactive signature of the blood of some fish in an environment, you can tell the shark is probably eating this fish, probably not eating these fish. 
Um, that's a that's a method that we're using. Um, next question. NOAA Fisheries has announced that um, January 1st is the start date for the 2016 Atlantic commercial shark fisheries. Is that a good idea? This has a, been a very active area of discussion on social media recently, and there's been a lot of wildly incorrect information shared. Uh, I think there are reasonable concerns with opening the fishery January 1st rather than in July, because in the spring there's a huge aggregation of lemon sharks in Florida, and it, when they're all together it's easier for fishermen to target them. So um, the, the, it opened in January every year until 2008. Uh, the last few years it's been opening later, so people are, are acting as if this is the first time that it's ever happened, and that's not true. It did, they did it for 20 years until a few years ago. People are acting as if NOAA did not allow for shark fishing at all until this coming year, which is not true. The U.S. is one of the largest shark fisheries in the world, and it's largely pretty well managed. Uh, people are saying just not helpful things about this, but I think there are legitimate concerns associated with uh, when the fishery opens and potential vulnerabilities of uh, all the lemon sharks that hang out in Florida. Even though many of the many of them spend their time in Florida state waters where lemon shark fishing is already illegal, some of them don't. Some of them go into federal waters where it, fishing is legal. And I think this is a follow-up to the question before. Could you potentially use accelerometer meters to study the feeding biology of sharks? Yes, and we do. Uh, accelerometers are the tools that are in your Nintendo Wii controller. Like you move it back and forth, and that and it measures how you move it and turns it into uh, your video game character moving. That we you can put that on 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 shark tags, and you can monitor their behavior and, and movement in three dimensions. Uh, and we we are doing that as well as a lot of other labs, and it can tell you a lot of really interesting things, uh, particularly when you combine that with other information. When do they accelerate versus what is happening in front of them at that point? When do they accelerate versus uh, a, a variety of other things? Um, and this one's kind of fun. Um, how did sharks survive the harsh environmental transitions that caused dinosaurs to become extinct? Well, not all of them did. Uh, there there are uh, there, there certainly have been many, many, many species of sharks throughout the ages that are not around anymore. But it's a uh, sharks are are uh, fairly adaptable. They've survived several mass extinctions, not just that most recent one. Uh, but they, what they are not adapted for is human industrial fishing practices. They they uh, generally just don't reproduce fast enough to replenish populations. Uh, Due to that, to replenish, to replenish population declines due to overfishing, they something like a mahi mahi uh, matures in a few years and can and can spawn with hundreds of thousands of eggs at a time. Something like a shark can it can take 10, 15 years to reach reproductive maturity, and then they have somewhere usually between two and ten babies every two, sometimes every three years. So it's way, they they reproduce much slower, and they have way fewer offspring. So they're not well. They're well adapted for a huge variety of changing environmental conditions, uh, but they're not particularly well adapted to human industrial fishing. Um, this is one of our last questions. If you guys have some more, please throw them in the in the hat. Um, do sharks live in communities, or do they have mates? Or I'm sorry, uh, do they have mates? Those are two separate questions. They're not linked. It varies pretty widely by species. That's going to be the answer to most questions about sharks, because again, there are over 500 species. Uh, some species are basically solitary. Some species school uh, pretty regularly or hunt together or uh, have annual mating aggregations. Some species uh, might have an individual that they prefer to spend time with. Uh, or a pr more than you would expect through random chance in a school, whereas others not really. So it depends pretty widely, but some there is some evidence that there are social groupings. Sharks are not monogamous; uh, they do not have one mate that's for life. Uh, they do not have even one mate per mating season. Uh, sharks can have what's many species of sharks that we've documented what's called multiple paternity. So if a female shark mates with three males, she may have a litter of pups that are fathered by each of the, or some of the pups are fathered by each of those three males. So the, the babies are born basically half siblings. So we're out, oh wait, sorry, we've got one more question that just came in. Maybe that'll be the last one. Um, do you think it would be possible to create an act to protect 
and of course this is something I can't read, um, Elasmo Blank. Elasmo Branks. There you go. It's the Similar science name for shark skates and rays. Oh, okay, there you go. Similar to the Marine Mammals and the Marine Mammals Protection Act. I don't think it's necessary. So I don't think we need to. I think the are there are some movements to protect sharks as a group. Uh, many islands are, are often it's it's been uh, Pacific islands where sharks are culturally very important, uh, and or places like the Bahamas where there isn't a huge shark fishery, uh, but there was talk of starting one. But there was a huge scuba diving industry. People have moved to protect all sharks from fishing, and that that depending on the depending on the situation, that can work pretty well. In a place like the United States, that's not going to happen because we do have a huge fishery. We there are particular species that are not well suited for fishing, and those are prohibited from being captured by federal law or by state level regulations. But don't fish for all sharks. I think d due to the constraints of what's called the Magnuson Stevens Act, I think that is not going to happen um, in U.S. waters. Uh, the shark, there are shark fishermen here. Uh, the U.S. government has to consider their st their needs as a stakeholder group, and if a, if a resource can be sustainably managed, then they are legally obligated to allow some fisheries exploitation of it. Okay, so I just want to reiterate what Walter had asked earlier. What are the top three things you want us to remember about sharks um, after today's session? Well, I'd, I'd like you to remember that there are a lot of myths about sharks. The, the media coverage of sharks is a dumpster fire, generally. Uh, there's just so many things that are just blatantly wrong and easily fact-checkable that are regularly printed in newspapers or set on news. Uh, that's concerning to me because it makes me wonder what the media is saying that's wrong about things where I'm not an expert. But the... There's a lot of wrong information out there, but there are ways to find right information, including going right to the source. Social, social media makes it easier than ever before in human history for people to find information directly from an expert. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Why Sharks Matter or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Why Sharks Matter. I interact with many other experts and share their views so uh, you can get a sense of, of who to follow through that. I also published a list for Scientific American of the best shark scientists to follow on Twitter. Uh, for Shark Week, so that's a way to, to that, so there's ways to find the real information, but if something sounds fear-mongering and nonsensical and doesn't make sense, it probably is. Uh, so there's a lot of myths out there, and the most pernicious of one, one is that sharks are incredibly dangerous, and you, you really don't need to worry about it, and in fact, sharks are ecologically and economically important animals, and we're better off with them than without them. Uh, the other thing I'd like everyone to keep in mind is that we, do, our lab does take groups or individuals out on the boat with us to tag sharks, and we've already taken one Duke Alumni Club and could do more. Uh, it's sharktagging.com if you go to the Participate tab. There's information there, or you can email me uh, directly. We'd love to take a gr your group, uh, your science class, your community organization, uh, your, you as an individual or you and a friend out on the boat with us to tag sharks and learn about local ocean conservation issues and what you can do to help. So those are your takeaways? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think we're about out of time. So thank you so much again, uh, Walter and David, for taking the time to do this with us. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And we hope you had a good lunch. And may the shark be with you guys. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye.